it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 133 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Phantom Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today is the Costa Rican coffee. It has notes of milk chocolate and wildflowers. Yay, I love it. And you too can drink Bantam Coffee Roasters. Where can they get it? BantamRoasters.com. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. See the difference with Neutrina NatureWise poultry feeds. NatureWise has the right mix of nutrients and ingredients for a healthier, happier, productive flock. Find NatureWise at a store near you at NeutrinaWorld.com and experience the difference today. Okay, we're here. It's mid-June. How are you doing? A little better now. It was insane for a while there at the end of May and early June. Crazy. Can we say crazy? Crazy. Crazy. Lots of stuff going on, but it's that time of the year that we wish for all year round to be busy with great weather and doing all the animal stuff, but not over busy. Well, we had that little hiccup with the shearer. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't going to say anything bad. And then my sheep that got cut up by the shearer developed a serious infection in her leg. Yeah, it wasn't good. And all the gloves were off then. So, yeah, (laughs) that's my lamb. So Phoebe's doing much better. The babies are big. The garden is weeded. Yeah, (laughs) my babies are getting huge. They're in a different brooder now. I got the elongated pop-up with the floor now. Game changer. Yeah, well, after you showed it to me, I got one too. They are like it's like a playground. Playland. They are loving it. And then they go outside, but they're not nearly ready to hang out out there all the time. Mm -hmm. So they have their little playground and they're... Big, long pop-up that they're loving. It's really great. Gigi's been all over. I mean, that girl, that personality on her, man. She needs to be on an album cover, no doubt. You got to get on that. I know. You got to write your songs and get your your who down on the album cover. I know. So, yeah. And we're coming up to one of my favorite seasons this weekend coming up. I'm going to the lavender farm. I can't wait. Oh, right. I love harvesting the lavender every year. I mean, we pay like $10 a person. And you get to cut as much lavender as you want. Is that the one where you got the cuttings for a couple bucks a piece? That, and then you pick when you cut your own, you well, fill a bag. I'm interested in the cuttings. So if she's still selling cuttings, can you grab me some? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Of course. Now that everyone knows that you're going to buy me some lavender. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, so this brings me to this. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, Head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It's another great way to help us grow. And I have a request. We're at 195 reviews. If we can make it to 200, I'm going to be cheering and dancing out with the chickens. So you guys, go leave us some reviews. We would love it. Because we need to see you cheering and dancing with the chickens. (laughs) If you're looking for other ways to help support the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell some chicken-loving friends about the podcast. Like a hundred. Yeah. You can visit our Etsy shop. Check out the t-shirts and mugs that we have there. We're going to have some new t-shirts before too long. And baseball caps and tanks. The tank Can't top- wait. Uh, the tank tops. Yeah, I'm all about that. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership. A gigantic thank you to all of our new patrons. We've had a lot lately. I love that Zoom call last month. It was amazing. Oh, yeah. It was a huge group and it was a lot of fun. I loved it. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! 
Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the red iron rooster trivet and the seed block. I really love that egg timer. It's going to be great when I'm baking. And those chicken stickers are going to be awesome on notes I send out. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. La, 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 time for the breed spotlight, yeah. 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 This is a happy introduction for a happy American chicken. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) So this week's breed spotlight, we're doing the... The Wyandotte. This is a crowd favorite. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Wyandotte is a beautiful American breed developed in northern New York. Hometown girl and boy. (laughs) (laughs) They're a dual-purpose breed. They are well-known for their gorgeous lace feathers in a variety of colors. And they're another success story. The Wyandotte graduated from the Livestock Conservancy's Conservation Priority List in 2016, along with another crowd favorite, the Orpington. Oh, yeah. Two totally different personalities, but both crowd favorites. Oh, yeah. Now, Wyandots are named for the indigenous Wyandotte people who once populated the northern U.S., and that includes upstate New York and up into Canada. Yes. So you're going to guess that this breed might be cold hardy. You think? Maybe. (laughs) Well, they're big and fluffy, so I would think. Yeah. (laughs) Now, this breed is beloved worldwide. It's shocking how many people have wine dots across the world. And here's the thing. You want to hear something even more shocking? You and I, we do not have wine dots. (laughs) We don't have wine dots, no. (laughs) But the wine dot has a huge following in the UK and Europe as well. They were first imported to the UK in 1881, and they were super popular with the poultry fanciers there. They were even used by commercial farmers up until the First World War. I mean, those feathers, you don't get more beautiful. Yeah, they're just gorgeous. It's a good thing, too, that they were popular in the UK because the only contemporary sources that I could find on the development of the wine. Let me guess. Lewis Wright. That's right. I told you. My old friend. (laughs) Rarely lets me down. (laughs) So we know that the Silver Lace Wine Dot was the first variety that was developed. It was in New York State in the late 1800s. But no one seems to know exactly who or why or exactly what foundation breeds were used. Okay. Usually, that's a little strange. It is. Usually you have some written records. I'm not sure I mean, why. somebody would want to take ownership of creating this beautiful, right. most popular bird. I mean. Yeah. Nope. So Lewis Wright writes. That's so awkward. Lewis writes. He writes. Lewis Wright writes. And let me tell you, he writes a lot. And thank goodness for it. it Stop <laughs> throwing shade at my man. <laughs> Lewis Wright writes that in 1873, the Wyandots first appeared in American poultry journals under the name Seabright Cochins. Oh, that makes perfect sense. They yeah, look exactly. a lot alike. The various journals also noted that the foundation breeds for the Silver Lace included Cochins and Silver Spangled Hamburgs. Shocker. We right. were just having the conversation before we hit that record button mm-hmm. about how much I believe the Wyandot looks like the Cochin. 
Now we were. Now I also saw a lot of mentions of dark Brahmas being used, which I could see, especially for the silver pencil, maybe for the body shape too. Mm -hmm. The silver laced wine dot was accepted into the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1883. Okay. Now I spent some time looking through old poultry journals. I also found that these birds were called American Seabrights. That Again, is no surprise right. to me. They look like a huge sea. <laughs> well, that's essentially what it was. Apparently, a lot of breeders were striving for a dual-purpose version of the Seabright Bantam with those spectacular feathers, but in a full-size fowl. So that means Ella's going to want Seabrights and Wyandots in because they're all so yeah, wine similar. Wyandots are stunners. They are. They really are. And they know it, too. They got that attitude to go with it. So there are several old books that were written like at the end of the 19th century and in the early 20th century about the care and breeding of wine dots. Right. I saw at least three, maybe more than that. Sometimes you can find them on Amazon or eBay as reprints. There's a lot of stuff because they're such a beloved breed. That's one good thing about when you have a breed that's so loved. There's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. I was just looking like the shirts, the pillowcases. It's all the wine dots. It's, there's tons. Yeah. And I think it all comes back to those feathers, honestly, the lace feathers. They're beautiful. I didn't find a lot of information about the decline of the breed and how they slipped into endangered status to begin with. So I'm just concluding that, that like so many heritage breeds, they just didn't fit industrial standards. Right. They fell out of fashion as backyard chicken keeping And fell then out backyard of fashion. chicken in itself fell out of fashion. That's what I just said. Well, <laughs> did you? I did. <laughs> I'll just say it again. How about that? Because <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Now, of a little bit of interest, there was a large white version of the Wyandotte that was actually used commercially in the UK. Okay. But they were supplanted by hybrid layers by the mid-20th century. I kind of can't see that, but okay. I mean, they're large. They're good egg layers. They're not like a leghorn. Why would you want to use this chicken for an industrial setting? Well, they're, they're beautiful feathers. I mean, come well, on. Well, they were white, though. So oh. they're large. We know that white- And in charge. Yeah, pretty much. So they're, they're large. We know that white birds are preferred for table birds yes. or the meat industry. And they probably laid enough. Like prior to the mid-20th century, we really didn't need super, super layers. No. You know? So now everybody wants the super layers. Right. And so that's what happened to these guys. The, the hybrids came in. So let's talk about their body shape. They're medium to heavy. They're like a heavier breed. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. And they've got a lot of fluff, a lot of feathers. The roosters are going to come in averaging at about eight and a half pounds. Hens are about six and a half pounds. They're in that larger category. Yeah. So you have to have the right accommodations for them, a bigger coop size, a bigger run size. If you want more than, let's say, three or four, you're going to have to make room for them. I think they look bigger than they are. I think it's the feathers. Yeah. They're, they're, they're it fluffy. could be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they have the rose comb. Sometimes the roosters can have, you know, the large mm -hmm. rose combs. It's not that enormous one, but it is bigger. Yeah. The one that gives me the willies. Yes. <laughs> they have a red face, red earlobes, and moderately sized waddles. Okay. The tails are not super long on either sex. They have yellow legs, a deep breast, and a moderately broad back. Mm -hmm. Okay. The tails are not really super long on either sex, but they're wide and they're full. Well, that's... And baby got back. Baby got back. That's the influence of the Cochin and the Brahma. Like the hens have this huge wide yes. cushion and the roosters, their tails are, they're flowing, but they're wide. I love my baby Cochins already because they're already looking like big fluff balls, like they're going to be big. And the girls call them the baby dinos because they, they walk the most like the hens that we've had, <laughs> like the baby dinos yes. with those feather legs. And the kids in the neighborhood all come over and they're like, look at those legs. And so, yeah. Because they I'm, have the vulture hawks on them too. Yeah, exactly. But I can definitely see the lacing and everything from the coaching and the wind. Pretty and amazing. I think the Hamburg, some of the lacing came from the Hamburg too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so they come in several color varieties. Let's go ahead and name these. The silver laced. The golden laced. The white. Black. Buff. Partridge. Silver penciled. Colombian. And finally, the blue. All these beautiful ones. They're gorgeous. There are also some non-APA accepted colors, and the most popular one is by far... The blue-laced red wine dot, exactly. which is 
hugely popular. It's, it's a beautiful bird. Everybody wants this color variation of the Wyandotte, I feel like. Now, Lewis Wright mentioned buff-laced and spangled Wyandots back about 1900. Wow, spangled. I wonder, spangled, yeah. I wonder if they still exist in the UK or anywhere else because they would be stunning. Okay, there are also bantams. And here's the thing. They already have a bantam, the sea bright. <laughs> 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 they don't need a bantam with the wine dot. They came from a sea bright man. Come on. The bantams are very popular with the show community. Yeah. Which I get. If you're breeding birds for showing. But if you want like a bantam version of the wine dot, get the sea bright. The sea bright needs some major help. Out oh, they there. absolutely do. So, yeah. Okay. So let's go into laying. Hens are good layers of large brown eggs at about 180 to 200 per year. Now, we know how I feel about this. That's like in the um, pretty good. Pretty good. I think that's very good, especially <laughs> for a hen this size. They're big. But yeah, I'm like, oh, okay, it's good. They will go broody. Next time you're in a box <laughs> laying 300 <laughs> eggs a year. That will not happen. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. So they're going to go broody. If you want a mama hen, a wine dot's going to help you out. They'll sit on the eggs and have a nice clutch for you. So. I read that they do go broody, but they're not obsessively broody like some of the breeds. Like, they're oh not God. in the box all the time. Corpingtons. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good thing. I mean, maybe that's why their numbers are a little higher than a lot of the bigger birds, because they don't go broody so often. Yeah. Okay, why nots are going to make a really good homestead breed. Yeah. No doubt about mm-hmm. it. They're great show chickens, and they're a great addition to your backyard. They're good layers and good broodies. Now, there is a little bit... They're going to have, we're going to have to go to a little bit of a downside here. Yeah. They have absolutely wonderful personalities with people. Just fantastic. But they can be bullies in a mixed flock of very gentle breeds. So they can be that mean girl in your flock. They have a reputation. Good reputation. Big reputation. Sorry. They, I had to put a little Taylor Swift in there. So oh, is that who that was? <laughs> I, I would not have known. But yeah. So they have a reputation of being a little bit of the mean girl. They apparently prefer to be the dominant birds, and they may cause trouble jockeying for position. Mm -hmm. Back to flock dynamics. Now, we can't say that every single wind up is going to be this way because chickens are individuals. Right. But there are definitely some reports that some will act this way. So this is why we always say with your flock to put alike birds together. So this bird, the Wyandotte might be good with Bard Rock, might be good with Rhode Island Red. Uh, that's what I was thinking. Uh, Moran's, some of the spicier girls that they're all going to be able to withstand each other a little bit better. Like, you're going to be mean to me? Oh, no, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be mean to you. You can have one of each and call them the Spice Girls. Oh, yeah. So that's why we say, like, put the like birds together because they'll be like, oh, no, you didn't. You didn't just take my nest box. I'm coming in and taking your nest box instead of, Having a Barnevelder in there and it's like, oh, oh my God, mm-hmm. and running. So, yeah. Right. So, this might be a good bird for- I, mean, I guess if you started off with a whole flock of birds and your wyan- you just let the Wyandots be the head hand and you didn't do anything to disrupt the dynamics, it might work out okay. Right. If you brought a meeker bird in after. Yes. So, you'd either have to start with the mixed flock. Right. The problem comes with integration. Yes. So sometimes what's going to happen is they may pick on a weak bird. That's why we're saying you need the stronger birds that that won't let them pick on them. Right. Yeah. I I think your options there are to start them off in a flock and they just naturally take the leadership position. Right. Or go with like birds afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. Because if, if they're in charge and you're bringing less dominant birds in, it may or may not work out. They may be really threatened. Or they or, may be subordinate and they may just make... Go right where they are need to go in the pecking order. But the problem is they do – they can be bullies. And so that begs the question. If you have an established flock and you bring wine dots in, are they going to be constantly challenging your leaders? Probably. Trying to work their way yes. up the pecking order. Yes. And that does not create a happy flock. It's so weird though because they, they have all the same qualities as a lot of the big gentle birds. And it's so weird that they have this – They have a strong personality. This personality quirk, Yeah. So, here we go. They are very good, shocker, in the cold. Yeah. <laughs> great for northern climates. <laughs> they're great. But in the summer, they're going to need shades. They got a lot of feathers. They're going to need fans, mm-hmm. all that stuff to keep them cool in the summer. Yeah, the rose combs, I feel like, probably don't give off as much body heat as, no say, a, a big straight comb would. Yeah, I agree. Now, the question. Where do you get the wine dot? 
Because they're no longer endangered, they generally show up in a lot of local farm and feed stores now. They do, and they have some of the really pretty lacing colors. Yeah, our local stores, the mill, had the blue laced red wine dots. They have like, and then they'll say, 10 chipped. It's like, seriously? Right. Ten of limited availability. <laughs> limited you're you're going to have like 50 people try to get 10 wine dots. Mm-hmm. This isn't going to go well. But do not despair because our old friends, McMurray Hatchery, they have a large variety. They have the silver lace. The golden lace. The white. The Colombian. And that gorgeous blue laced red. And why even have to wait in a line? You just place your order and then they come to you. It's the best way to go. There are also wine dot clubs literally all over the world. So European and Australian listeners, Google is your friend. Yes. You can find why not breeders nearby. Yes, you can. And like you said, Farm Supply Store, McMurray Hatchery, these places are great and show off these beautiful birds. Now here, this is where I'm going to go. If you have the wine dot, we want to flood our Instagram stories with pictures of your wine dots this week. Please DM us the pictures and I will give you a story. We are loving the fact that you're sending pictures in of your chickens. We love to see them. Oh, yeah. Some of those whiting true blues we've seen, the whiting true greens were amazing. They were fantastic. We also have- The uh, Polish. Everybody's sending them in. We love them. We actually got some really fantastic photographs from one of our regular listeners, Chelsea. Oh, yeah. She had a wonderful photo of her grandmother holding a hand and then a recent photo of her grandmother getting eggs from Chelsea's flock. They were really, really touching. They were wonderful. Yeah. We love seeing your pictures. Send us that kind of stuff. We love it. Thanks, Chelsea. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. For a healthier, happier, productive flock, try Neutrina NatureWise Poultry Feeds. NatureWise has the right mix of nutrients and ingredients based on the latest industry research for poultry. From chick starter feed to layer feed, NatureWise supports consistent egg production, stronger eggshells, and shinier feathers adding up to a difference you can see. Buy NatureWise at a store near you at NeutrinoWorld.com and experience the difference today. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have a really special main topic this week. We're really excited to bring you some special guys from Neutrina Foods. We love it. Yes. We have Mark Eggers, who is the Innovation and Tech Lead at Neutrina. And we have Twain Lockhart, who is the Species Specialist on the retail side of Neutrina. These gentlemen are joining us to chat all about Neutrina feeds and products. And they're going to give us a peek into the process behind the Neutrina feed. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, glad to be here. We're so excited that you're here on the show. We're, this is going to be great. I love a round table. It's going to be awesome. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Yeah. We have a lot of longtime listeners, but we have a lot of listeners who are both new to the podcast and new to chickens in general. And so we want to give them a little bit of the background of Neutrina. Neutrina has been around since about the 1920s, so about 100 years. Can you Mm -hmm. tell us a little more about the company? Yeah, yeah, sure can. Actually, even goes back further than that. Uh, The Cargill family started the Cargill Incorporated business uh, clear back in uh, 1865. Wow. Um, Yep. So uh, the Cargill family still owns Cargill, family-owned business. Uh, largest family-owned business uh, here in the United States. I think uh, Twain would probably agree with me on this. Doesn't feel that big. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, There's still definitely a family feel to it. Uh, You get to know an an awful lot of our leaders. But uh, yeah, so it was founded in in Iowa, in uh, kind of on the Iowa-Minnesota border in 1865. Neutrina Feeds was actually brought into Cargill in uh, 1921. was really one of the first feeds was chicken feeds that Neutrina was really known for. And so it's uh, really kind of fun working for a company that has that real long history like that. And, uh, and actually that long history in backyard poultry. I love fun. that. I love it. And the thing that when Holly and I were looking back and we were trying to find some little tidbits about Neutrina and Cargill, we found the old jingles and they oh. are so cool <laughs> to listen to. When you sit there and you're like, oh man, that's really cool. And the fact that their first, Neutrina's first feed was was poultry. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, I like to joke that when Wiley Cargill crossed the plains in his covered wagon, Mark was bouncing around in the back of that because he's been <laughs> so long. He's out of high school then. <laughs> yeah, that's what I get for being around so long, right? Yeah. Oh, well, there is, there's currently an anniversary video from Cargill Neutrina that's out, and we can link to that in the show notes. And it shows some of the magazine advertisements, which are like yeah. 1940s housewives with their lipstick on holding a chick. I mean, it's really, really yep. fantastic stuff. Yeah, so I love those jingles. I mean, it's so cool to hear those. And when you listen to them, it just takes you back. There's something very nostalgic about feeding a food from a company that's been since 1865. And the thing that I love about that is you've had a lot of years to scientifically keep testing and improving and making the feed what it needs to be for the modern poultry. And I love that about the food. Were, Were those jingles radio ads? Were they played on the radio? So they were. Yeah, those were radio ads back then. And yeah, really kind of cool, right? Little catchy little jingle that, we don't yeah. have anything we don't have cool radio or tv ads for chicken food anymore i love that <laughs> we need to bring those back we yeah. need to do a photo shoot in our 50s gear yeah, with yeah, holding yeah. chickens and the jingle playing in the background that yeah, would be we're, awesome we're, we're, yeah we're there yeah singing feed your chicks new trina <laughs> new trina right yeah i love it <laughs> that's fantastic brilliant <laughs> okay so this brings us into another question and it's really personal. It's just to tell us a little bit about yourselves and your background. And the question that everybody's going to want to know is, do you guys have your own chickens? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'll I'll start here. Yeah. My name's Mark Eggers and I I have to confess, I have a chicken problem. (laughs) You're in good company. Yeah. No, I've been with Cargill for 30 years, live in Nebraska, started out uh, in 4-H also, had uh, cattle, sheep, We had chickens on the place and then, you know, kind of went off to college and whatnot, got married and everything and and didn't have chickens for a long time here uh, about uh, coming up on a little over, what, three years, about three years ago now, got chickens again. We have uh, 23 hens in the backyard here right now, adding a second coop. So the chicken math has started. Excellent. Adding that second coop. And then uh, we we have a bunch of uh, chicks we're raising too on top of that. Tell us a little bit about the breeds of chickens you have. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, so we started out with some Americanas and then we added some Bard Rocks and some Sapphire Gems. And then now I've really kind of gotten into, I've got a soft spot for the Wyandots. Okay. So, Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful. So One of those all American chickens. Lace. Yeah. yeah. And then my wife just loves the buff Brahmas. So, oh, got a few so does Holly. A woman yeah. with excellent taste. Clearly. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, Twain. So tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> okay. So my wife and I live in Southern Wisconsin with our little mean little dogs and uh, our chickens. 
Uh, right now, we only have eight chickens. Uh, we had some raccoon issues last year, and we just redid the coop to make it uh, raccoon proof. Uh, and now we only have eight. We've had as many as 300. When wow. We were at like 40 when we had the raccoon problem. So we ended up rehoming most of those. Uh, we were losing a couple every night and, and until we got the coop secured. So we're secure. We've got eight. Right now, they're kind of boring. We just have some uh, gold comets which really good functional birds. If it's got feathers on it, I've probably raised it at one time or another. I am a big fan, and a lot of people do not like this breed. I'm a big fan of Naked Necks. Okay. <laughs> That's one of my favorite breeds. People hate on them all the time, and they're mean to them, and they're neat chickens. They're like evil, genius, smart chickens. I like <laughs> smart chickens, okay? I don't understand why somebody would beat up on the naked net chickens. We just did a breed spotlight about what, Holly, a month or two ago on that breed. And yeah. they're quite fascinating and they have yeah. wonderful personalities. Yeah. They're a great addition to a backyard flock, for sure. They Definitely. are. They're just, they're really, really smart birds. They're also very uh, re uh, disease resistant. They've got real strong immune systems. They're, like I say, they're not for everybody just because they are kind of like evil genius smart. If there was mischief, our girls terrorize the neighborhood. They get to go out all over the neighborhood. If there was mischief, the naked necks were in the middle of it and they were <laughs> leading the charge, okay? They're right up in your business. They want to know what you're doing, but they're just really smart, friendly birds. We only had a handful of them, but they were all the alpha chickens were all naked necks. And they all had Eastern European names because as nice. you probably know, they're from Transylvania. Yes. So it was kind of like this little Eastern European mafia that ran the coop. <laughs> um, they live a long time. Uh, people, one of the, I'm going to say it's kind of a misconception. They, they are cold hardy. They do well up here. I'm in Wisconsin. Uh, we don't heat the coop. They do just fine. If anything, they get sunburned in the summertime. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sure that they definitely do get sunburned. Yeah, my, my neighbor, he and I have gone around and around a couple times. We had uh, a hen saddle on one of the hens that the rooster wouldn't leave alone. It was camo colored and he's in the National Guard and he comes over and he said, hey, what, what are you doing with the chickens? And me just being the wise, you know what? I said, oh, Neutrina is, you know, experimenting with uh, chickens and body armor and combat zones. Stop. And he says, really? And I go, no. He didn't talk to me for about six months. He went <laughs> to the sticker, you know. And then about a year later, he comes over and he asks me what, what I'm doing to these poor chickens. He's Because it was molting season. They look like topless waitresses. Uh, he thought I was doing something weird to the chickens. And I said, I want you to Google something. And he goes, what? And I said, Google naked neck chickens. And he just, he didn't say a word. He just looked at the pictures. He scrolled a little bit and he turned around and he walked away. <laughs> I love it. Cause he's like, oh my God, the military is doing something to the chickens. Yes, and, and we're, we're Twain's over there. To <laughs> yes. That's not good. So, not good. I also like Brees chickens. I don't know if you're familiar with Brees's. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, the definitely. American Brees, I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of those. Uh, they're a great dual purpose bird. And then the weird one, we used to show birds. I like A-seals. I don't know if you know what an A-seal is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I like smart chickens. Now, the breeses aren't so smart, but the A-seals and the turkins are super smart birds. So. Twain, have you ever had Egyptian Fayumis? <laughs> I, I have. I wasn't that big a fan of them. They were kind of flighty, the ones I had. Mine so, are the masterminds. Mine are the evil geniuses. Really? My, I think mine will take over the world. Seriously. <laughs> really? It's a running joke about Holly's Egyptian babies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's something. When people say, oh, chickens, you know, they're all the same. The, one of the myths I try to uh, pop, I try to pop this bubble, is that all chickens are the same. They are exactly. not. They have very different personalities, different intelligent levels. I mean, I'm sorry, at the bottom of that intelligent list is going to be your Cornish cross meat birds, <laughs> dumber than a bag of hammers. They just are. Okay? Maybe it's but, nature's way of protecting them also, because, you know, they don't want to know what's going to happen. So maybe it's nature's way of kind of protecting maybe, them in a way. I think it's more like 70 years of selective breeding. We bred oh, yeah, them. that too. Um, but, you know, it's my self-imposed mission. I think everybody should have backyard chickens. I'm a total extrovert. I'm an introvert's worst nightmare. So if somebody's me too. trapped with me, yeah. So if I'm somebody's trapped with me like at the dentist <laughs> office, I'll just start talking to them. 
And my opener is usually, hey, do you have chickens? Me too. <laughs> and, okay. Oh, my God. Twain and I are going to get along so well. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have like all these phone conversations about chickens all the time. Yep. And so I'm very, very keen on getting people started with the right kind of chickens. I can't tell you how many people I've run into that said, yeah, we tried that. And I'm, well, what'd you start with? Oh, these big white birds and they grew real fast and they were real. No, that is not a beginner's chicken. No. Right. I know there's I mean, a lot of people who love leghorns. I don't really think a leghorn is a beginner's chicken either, but there's it's a reason than a cornish. There's yeah. a reason why the breed spotlight that we do every week and I we love that. It, 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 t- it teaches everyone about the breeds because every yep. breed is so different and yes. you have to know what's going to fit into your life and your flock and what's going to work for you. These chickens are all very different. And that's what you're saying. It, it's true. Not one chicken is the same to another chicken, yep. even yep. within a breed. Personalities. Say, they have personalities. Yeah. Yeah. And I have run into people that. They said, yeah, we got some naked necks. We didn't like those. I go, why? And he goes, I just don't like a chicken that like wants to know every single thing that I'm doing. You know, not everybody <laughs> wants a chicken up in their business. So <laughs> I enjoy that, but not everybody does. I enjoy that, too. I like Me my chicken nosy. I like my chickens all around. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you, so you guys can tell Twain's been around the chickens for a long time, right? <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so yeah. We, we, we joke on our backyard poultry team that Twain was actually there when the first chicken crossed the road. Yes. <laughs> Good heavens. My first chickens, this is a, I, I'm a font of stupid chicken stories. I want to do segments, just ch- stupid chicken stories. When I was about seven years old, my dad won a one-eyed gamecock in a poker game. And he brought this thing home and it was meaner than the devil. It chased me around the yard and my parents, this is in an era, you know, in the 60s, they thought this was funny. Of course, this is going to be one of those chickens that's going to live forever. And he chases me around. And one day I come home from school and I just was not in the mood. And he and I had a come to Jesus moment. And I came out on top and he and I became best of friends after that. (laughs) And believe it or not, when Peppy died, I cried my eyes out because he he lived like another seven or eight years. He was old when he died. Wow. And, you know, I always say, no, we're not rednecks. My dad won a Gamecock in a poker game. But I mean, (laughs) hey, those were my first chickens. (laughs) That does sound like a good a good segment but, for the show, Chris. Every week, Twain needs to come on and give us a stupid chicken story. A exactly. Chicken story. And you That's know what I was going to say is, you know, with the right resources, your chickens can live very long and healthy yeah. lives. And that's why it's important to educate because this day and age, there's a lot of resources out there to keep those chickens healthy and a lot of things that you can do and have <laughs> to help them along the way. That's for oh. sure. Yep. <laughs> I uh, will take rescue roosters and I use them in my seminars and I I have them trained where they'll just stand on a block on the table while I'm talking. As fascinating as I think I am to a five-year-old, I'm not very fascinating. Okay. But that chicken is, and they'll set and that keeps the kids quiet and I can do my thing. And my first seminar rooster lived to be 11. So he he was a rescue bird and he lived a long, good, long life. Nice. So, That's yeah, awesome. you're right. You definitely can get them to live a long time. So you kind of have the pulse of the chicken world. What kind of trends have you seen in chicken keeping over the last few years? And both of you can answer this. The pandemic opened up the door. I think what, what I've seen is when when times are uncertain, people are comforted by backyard chickens. It's like a safety net. Yeah. Oh, if, you know, everything goes to heck in a handbasket. I can always, you know, eat my chickens. I can eat the eggs. So we saw that during the pandemic. And then when egg prices rose, we saw that again. You know, there was a ton of misinformation from that first group out there. I'm sure you saw all of that on, on Facebook and stuff. Oh, yes, um, we did. But we're, we're working to educate. And the challenge is, is I would see that on, on these posts, you'd have somebody actually try to answer the question correctly, and they would get shouted down by all the conspiracy theorists. Yep. And then oh, after yeah. a while, a lot of times your experts just quit, quit trying. So you had that going on. I think the trend is going to continue through this year. I think it may slow down some next year. Now, one of the concerns we had was that during the pandemic and that big upswing was that people would get rid of them as soon Mm -hmm. as we got it. No, we didn't see that. And and I think part of that is, too, due to we definitely see a really a growing trend, especially with some of our younger families 
that it's really become important to them to raise food sustainably. And also for them, I think, to uh, not only kind of know where their food comes from, but it's also important for them to to actually provide some of the food, not all food, but, you know, they're still going to buy at the grocery store and, and whatnot, but they still want to provide some food to their family. And so that backyard poultry is a great way to get into that. They're still, they can be a pet too. You know, we're just a uh, fascinating statistic that we just saw here is actually uh, poultry back to chickens just became the third most popular pet uh, behind only dogs and cats and Yay. In on cats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. You know, I think that says a lot for we, we think the, the backyard poultry industry is definitely here to stay and going to continue to grow. What Twain was saying that in times of need and times of yep. social distress, people go because what they're comforted is, yes, I can do this. And, you know, my funny story is everybody says, well, if the apocalypse happens, somebody's going to come. I said, no, no one's coming to get my chickens. They're going to be sleeping on my head in my bed <laughs> and I'll have a shotgun protecting them because I want those eggs forever. So, yeah. And you know what? Bringing eggs into your diet and being able to bring them in yourself is a nice way. Yeah to bring the food source in and you can do hundreds of thousands of things really with eggs. Yep. So it's, it's a great way for people to be able to bring some food into the family by growing their own. Yeah. Think- and back to all of our ties with 4-H, that is a excellent, excellent way to develop just not only that animal husbandry skills, but even just, uh, you know, respect for animals taking care of yourself and responsibility with your kids, you know, let your kids go out and uh, do, do chicken chores, right? Um, That's mine. Collect collect (laughs) eggs, right? And that's, uh, yeah, it's a great way to to bring up a family. Yeah. I feel like you mentioned something, Mark, that we've tried to touch on a, a few times in the show. And that is the fact that you can have food security and pets. These two things do not have to be mutually exclusive. Your food exactly. providers can be your pets. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's that's definitely true. And, you know, I, I'm a firm believer, too, in just in animal agriculture. I grew up on a, we, we grew up on a cattle ranch mm-hmm. and farm, okay? And, and I named some of my 4-H calves, too. And at the end, yeah, they were, ended up going to the sale barn and, you know, and ended up on our table too. Right. And that that's part of learning about where your food comes from and that whole responsibility. And I think that that's something that, uh, yeah, you definitely can have pets, uh, treat animals with respect, treat them extremely well and still be part of the, the food industry. Right. The thing yeah. that's so great about the chicken and poultry is they can give you the eggs. It's a natural reproductive process exactly. and you can care and love for them as a pet. And you don't have to do yes. anything in the end. The exactly. eggs are what they give you and you can eat them and make so many things out of them. It's wonderful. Yeah. So this brings me into Neutrina offers two lines of poultry feed. Both are equally great. So tell us a little bit about nature wise and the country feeds. The analogy I like to use is General Motors makes Chevrolet and they make Cadillac. So Country Feeds would be like your Chevrolet and Nature Wise is your Cadillac. The Nature Wise has more functional additives like pre and probiotics. It has an immune system booster. Although the Country Feeds, we just added the pre and probiotics to that. But the Nature Wise is also natural. It is a vegetarian diet. It has the pre and probiotics. It has an immune system booster. Now it has essential oils in it. I've been feeding my flock NatureWise since it became available in the mill. Well, thank you. I do have some NatureWise with me. The crumble is amazing. And what I love about it is the smell. It the smells smell. so good. Yeah. It smells amazing. That's so, the essential oils and yep, they're oregano. Yes. The smell. Yep. You open that bag now, and you're like, this is chicken it. food. <laughs> yeah, we didn't put it in there. This is a side benefit. That was not put in there for that aroma. That's just a side benefit. What we found is that the essential oils made everything else work together even better. So the oh. chickens, you know, chickens self-regulate very, very well in their diet. So they end up eating less and produce more eggs. I mean, it's just a win-win across the board. The nature wise, like I say, that's our Cadillac. Mark, did you want to talk about the country feeds? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, country feeds is really uh 
put together for those people that are uh, really looking for that good, solid nutrition that you can trust, right? People maybe that have uh, either bunch of birds that, you know, then cost becomes maybe a little bit of a determining factor. They kind of have to watch that just a little bit tighter, but that's still a really, really good option for for uh, people with country feeds. And country feeds is also our line where it gives us a little bit more ingredient options there of what we can use for that. Also allows us to, like our duck feeds and whatnot, sit in that line too, just so to where we can balance for some different types of types of backyard poultry that we, we see out there. Yep. Yeah, both of Holly and I feed the nature wise when we feed our flock. We love that food. I use country feeds off flock. Because I have so many roosters. And the reason I use the country feeds is because it has the lower calcium level. Yeah, right. Oh, I have so many roosters. I have a bachelor flock (laughs) and have rescue flock. They're all on the country feeds off flock. Because again, the calcium level is right where I want it for my roosters. Yep. Yeah, that works really, really well. So all flock for anybody out there that does have roosters, all flock uh, does work really, really well if you've got roosters around. So whether that is the country feeds or the nature wise, either will work, work really well for that. Yeah. We always recommend the off flock. Yeah. Thank you both for supporting Neutrina. Of course. course. It's an amazing product. It really is. So we touched a little bit on the beginning of the year where people were, people were really confused about what feeds they should feed because there was fear that there weren't real nutrients in the chicken food. I can say that I never had none of my chickens ever ceased laying when they should have. So we did, we did not have this experience ourselves. We didn't have this experience, but again, for people who are new and don't know the answer to this, what does your quality control process look like? So we check all uh, ingredients when they come into the plant. That's something that um, we have uh, maybe a little bit different take on how we put our rations together. So we look at everything on a nutrient basis because things do change, right? So we don't look at things like maybe easiest way to explain this is not as like a recipe. So you use so many pounds of this ingredient, so many pounds of this. What we do is we take an analysis of that particular ingredient that comes into the plant, put that into our database, and then we look at what is short then or what needs to be supplied then from our premixed nutrition into that diet. Okay. So that that way we make sure that we know that things are variable and we take that variability into account to make sure that each and every bag of nature wise or country feeds uh, that you would buy is what it says it is. Because we know that there's loads out there of feed that come into our plants that we reject And I've been sitting in a plant before when we've rejected one and I've watched it drive out of our driveway, still full, drive down the the street to a different plant and they unload. You know, that's something that, you know, it goes somewhere, right? Yeah. And that is our quality control is we do have a set of what we call gold standard that also allows us to look at each specific product plant to plant. So that way, if you get, uh, let's say, NatureWise Feather Fixer uh, that comes out of our Albany, New York plant, it looks just like our Feather Fixer that comes out of our Milton, Wisconsin. And that's extremely important to us to make sure that we know that each and every bag of that feed is the same. That's definitely one of the areas that we look at and we work really, really hard on is quality control coming into our plants. That's That's what I love about your company. Yeah. So that brings me into my next question, because there's a product that you guys put out that's one of my most favorite products of all time that we recommend to everyone during molting season. And it's there's no other product out there like the Feather Fixer, because the Feather (laughs) Fixer... It, it's a product that is necessary and it helps these chickens during molt. And there's nothing else like that on the market. And it's amazing. We all use it every year and you can see the difference when you start using it. Yeah. There was three of us that um, we're, we're what we call solution driven. So if someone comes to us and says, Hey, we're looking for this, we have this problem. 
What can you do about it? So I go to a lot of chicken shows. The chicken show people were looking for a diet that would improve the plumage after molt, after the birds molt in. So I took that back to our leadership team and they said, no, the show world's too niche a market. So I said, well, what if we made this in a molting diet that appeals to everybody? And that was your feather fixer. And what's funny is I don't have any alphabet behind my name. The one other lady had never owned chickens before. And the nutritionist is primarily a dairy nutritionist. And he's the father of feather fixer. But he came up with this. It hit the market. Now, a little history here on, on retail poultry feed. There really hadn't been any innovations in a long time in retail poultry yeah. feed. Commercial, yeah, but not retail. And so when this product hit the market, it was like, you know, stodgy neutrina, conservative neutrina, doesn't do anything <laughs> new, launched this new innovative product. It kind of set the poultry industry on its ear. And even then, it took several years for our competitors to, and there are several imitators out there, several knockoffs of Feather Fixer, but it took them a few years to do that. It moves kind of slow, and I'm very proud of it because once we broke that ceiling, now we innovate poultry feed. Now we're doing things like the essential oils and the immune system boosters, and we have an additive in the nature wise that helps keep coop odors down. And this all stemmed yeah. from. You know, this conversation the three of us had at lunch one time in Minnesota uh, about coming out with a molting diet. I love so it. I'm, it's, uh, I'm very proud of that. It's one of my most favorite products. Now, my request to you guys is, okay. can we can we make it in a crumble? crumble. <laughs> you're, you're one of the crumble fans, right? Yes. So I, like my flock, my well, entire flock eats crumble. We so. had it, but we couldn't sell enough of it. We had it in a crumble and it did not sell enough. And so they pulled the plug on us before I felt we had a had enough time to get its legs under it. Because if you have bantams, you know, it's hard for bantams yes. to eat many yeah. pellets and things like yeah. that. So, yeah, no, I get it. I, we definitely, I was very proud of that product too, but it didn't last very long. We'll, we'll a, take that feedback back though, because we're yeah. always working on new things. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- we absolutely have will. The flock fixer is amazing. And yeah. the premise behind it is something that's necessary and yeah. works well with these chickens. Most yep. of my chickens are big chickens. I like the Asiatics, Jersey Giants, mm-hmm. the Americans. Yeah. But my husband and I do very limited conservation breeding of Nankin bantams. And if you've oh, ever seen, okay. a, nan- yep. oh, if yeah. you've ever oh, seen yeah. a Nankin, you know how tiny they are. And well, so, the Sarama people loved the crumble. They yes. loved the feather fixer crumble, but they yeah. just, they weren't buying enough of it to keep it. And crumble. honestly, yeah. not only would I like to see feather fixer and crumble, I'd like to see all flock and crumble. Right now I have a flock of, what's in my flock right now? Six, because one guy is going to a new home. So right now I have six Nankin cockerels in a bachelor flock. And if I could feed them a neutrina all flock crumble, I, it would be golden. It would be amazing. There you go. We'll take that back with us and we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. The yes. chicken ladies, the chicken ladies said, <laughs> get right. crumble. Exactly. Well, that's what I tell everyone. Exactly. Well, anytime we spotlight a bantam, we say, if you're going to keep your bantam cockerels in with your flock, you want to have your girls on oyster shell and you want to feed your boys off flock crumble, but you have yeah. to find yep. it. It always blows my mind when I hear people with bachelor flocks because I grew up and we showed American games and I always jokingly say it's like Highlander. There can only be one. You can't put <laughs> a bachelor flock of those. Oh, like no. ACL. If you mix oh, those, you, you would only have one. Yeah. So. Yeah. But Nankins, I mean, the boys, no. I love my bachelor flock. They're so sweet and they get along so well. They're in the sheep field on the other side of the farm. And all the other chickens are on the other side of the house. So as long as they can't see girls, it's fantastic. It's yeah. the cutest yeah. thing. You could do it with modern games. And for the record, we do support three different chicken rescues. There's one in California, Funky Chicken, that we support. Yes. The, the Chicago Roo Crew, we support them. And then Rooster Ridge here in Wisconsin. So That's uh, awesome. they pick That's up amazing. a lot of the roosters that, you know, people go and they buy and they can't have, you know, they live in town. They can't have a rooster. And these these rescues pick them up. So. I mean, we love Funky Chicken. I mean, she does amazing things yes. with all of the animals that she takes, and they're yeah. fantastic. That's yeah. the thing that gets me is roosters do get a bad rap when it comes to, oh, the crow, and they do this. It's nothing different than a dog barking. Come on. <laughs> 
Let's yeah. let these boys be boys out there and everybody have their roosters if they want yeah. to. But hopefully we're slowly making a change. Now back to a little bit to the crumble. Hopefully now yeah. with the surge coming back up with chickens, yep. the crumble might be better seller at this point than it was in the past. Yep. And we're working on a couple other things too with just some new technologies around some different forms of feed too that that'll be interesting here that you'll be seeing shortly. Well, that takes yeah. us into our next question. Yeah. <laughs> what is on the horizon for Neutrina Feeds? <laughs> there you go. So we are working with uh, our new NatureWise Nourishing diets that are out. The first two we have is a floating duck formula and a layer formula. Nice. That is in kind of a new form that we call it a mini bit there's a chick starter that looks like a crumble that is actually this mini bit. It's, and you can okay. get that. It's just being launched in a few stores in certain markets in the U.S., kind of throughout the Midwest is that, where well, we're first testing that. In so, the U.K., right. they tend to do it. They have right. the bits yep. in the U.K. a little bit yeah, more the, right now. The micro yep. pellets or micro crumble. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's just launching now. And a couple of really neat things about that is just no waste. So the, the one kind of downside we hear to a crumble, right, is crumbled, there is some fines. And that's just kind of part of making a crumble, right? Well, in this process, you don't have to break that apart. So we don't have near the amount of fines that, that is in a crumble. And it's actually a very, very consistent product size. Both Dwayne and I have tested it mm -hmm. on birds of our own and birds just, just love it. Absolutely love it. Nice. Yeah, that's something you're going to definitely be seeing new so coming out. Great. We didn't mention this, but the essential oils, it's going to be in the nourishing as well. And what we saw yep. with the baby chicks, if you've ever raised a large number of baby chicks, <laughs> pasty butt. We saw no pasty butt. And that's a big, big deal for, for yeah. a lot of people. So yes, definitely. Uh, just really strong, robust chicks. I was really, really impressed with how, how the chicks performed on the nature was with the essential oils. Yeah. And that, that's probably, that's the other thing that you're going to continue to see, you know, out of our research that we've had here recently, a lot of work has been done around the essential oils. We're definitely the, the leader in that, in that part of the market. There's definitely more to come. We're doing more and more all the time around essential oils. And we've seen a really big impact on what essential oils have been able to do with the gut health and a healthier bird. And really that has led to very much supports uh, maximum egg, egg production. We're seeing more eggs, you know, when, with the essential oils on some of the, on the Cornish crosses, we're definitely seeing more breast meat with uh, the essential oils. We're definitely going to be doing more around that. And kind of the next place we're looking is kind of around nutrition of the egg. So kind of some neat stuff to come. So that sounds great. It does sound great. Can you just give us a very brief outline of what the floating waterfowl food does? And I ask this because selfishly, I'm getting ducks next spring. And also because we've seen a huge rise in the increase of people keeping ducks. Yeah. Yeah. This floating feed, definitely you can, you know, ducks like water, right? Ducks <laughs> love to be in the water all the time. The floating feed, you can feed either on the ground or on water. It does float. You can use that that way. Also on our duck feed, we've got the duck and all flock starter. That is another part of kind of what's on the horizon or what's new for Neutrina. And that falls in the country feeds line. But we just did come out here last summer with the duck and all flock starter. Nice. And that product, there's not really another one out there. Companies have got duck feeds, but nobody has strictly a duck and all flock starter feed. That's and, amazing. Uh, a lot of companies have a one size fit all. Yeah, uh, when yep. it comes to ducks, and and they don't have the same nutritional needs. We actually had several nationally known exhibition duck people help us with both of these products and being formulated for lower mycotoxins, yep. lower calcium, higher niacin for the leg mm -hmm. health. The floating duck is going to be really great for geese because there's no animal byproducts in that one. So oh. geese do a little better on a vegetarian diet. Yes. Um, ducks. Yep. 
do better with a little bit of animal protein in there. They can both cross over. There's not enough either way to hurt them, but I think that I think the floating feed is going to become the go-to goose food on the market. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Oh, it's what you would expect from a company that's been around since 1865, <laughs> still innovative products coming out, still doing yeah. the research, still coming out with new things and rethinking. I love it. It's awesome. Thank you. Well, we're not afraid to go outside the box a little bit and bring in people. I mean, I'm a chicken guy. I know enough about ducks and waterfowl to be dangerous. I have raised them, <laughs> but I'm not a duck guy. But I know people that live and breathe ducks. And I was like, okay, what are your pain points? What do you want in duck feed? We pulled about six of these guys and a couple of gals. We kind of condensed it. Nobody gave us the same answers, but they all overlap. The higher niacin, lower calcium, no mycotoxins. Those came up over and over. So, yeah. And Love that's it. one thing, too, about just the innovation side of our business and always looking at some of that research is that's even a little different kind of in how we do that. I see so many companies and not just feed companies, just companies in general that will go out there, kind of create something or find something kind of unique. And then they go out and they try to fit it into a product and then find a way to sell it. Actually, we kind of go about it a completely different way. We get a lot of consumer feedback. We've got a group within the company that is our consumer insights group, and they do a tremendous amount of good for our company and take a lot of consumer feedback and find out really what are pain points, what, what consumers really want want and what they really need. And then we take that and we say, okay, these are the pain points. Now we look for a solution. How can we fix that? And that is absolutely how we come up with the whole essential oils piece into nature wise. And even looking at Twain when how he was describing how you know, come up with feather fixer. You know, there was there was a problem out there, right? And so then what could we do to fix that problem? And that's how we look at research. We try to find something and go out there and find something that there's a pain point for instead of figuring out a way to do something and then trying to figure out how you can put it in a product and sell it. The essential oils part of it, I love because so many people want to feel like they're natural and doing everything yeah. all natural and they use the essential oils, but sometimes you can hurt them in different ways of using the essential oils. So you yep. guys have already done all the scientific research. It's at the proper amount. You can give the essential oils within the food and know that you're doing the best for the poultry versus versus kind of playing your own scientific little game with sometimes you give too much, sometimes you don't. Even with yep. people, I was reading somewhere in a chat room that too much peppermint causes burning, like it can burn yep. your throat and different things. So having it already formulated and seeing that need and making it so natural, but also so t scientifically correct, it's the best of both worlds with your foods. It's amazing. We're really fortunate too that that we have the research capabilities to be able mm -hmm. to do this. So we can go to Elk River, Minnesota, where our innovation center is, and we have access to feeding both growing birds and layers there. And we can do research there on large scale that can give you scientific data, right? But we also know from talking to a lot of consumers that most of them really don't care much about that. They want to know, is it going to work for my six different hens back home in my yeah. backyard? So we take what we learn at Elk River and then we put it into backyard situations and what we call our infield trials. And then we make sure it works there before then we launch it into a product that you'd see in your stores. So yeah. the consumer can feel good that this is tested all the way around and it's going to give their poultry the optimum results of great eggs, great feathers, great everything. Yep. Absolutely. It's great. So we're going to end the interview with a question that we ask everybody. And it's so unfair, but we do it anyway. It's unfair for ourselves, too. But you both can go. What are your favorite breeds of chickens or chicken or chickens? So I have a soft spot for some barred rocks. That was kind of my first original soft spot. Let's see, I'm going to cheat on you already. You asked me for my favorite breed. I'm going to give you a two. <laughs> That's okay. 
but I love silver lace Wyandots. They're nice. stunning. They're stunning birds. Yeah. They're beautiful. For me, it's the naked necks from the time they're day old with their little bull. They have little bull haircuts. Have you ever noticed yes. naked neck chickens have bull haircuts? Just their personality, their intelligence. They're just tough, hardy birds. Mine all lived to be well over six years old. I mean, they were like seven or eight when they passed. And our, by the way, for the record, as long as our chickens are good chickens, they get to live their life out. And what's a bad chicken, you might be asking. My wife doesn't tolerate a mean rooster, and she doesn't tolerate egg eating very well. So as long as they don't eat eggs, they die of old age on our property. So As they all should. <laughs> as they all should. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the way I, I mean, they eat, they eat five pounds of food a month. It's not going to break the bank. <laughs> um, my neighbors all whine about ticks. We haven't seen a tick in decades. Okay. Yeah. The girls are out there eating the ticks. And, and I mean, yeah. so even if she didn't lay eggs... But naked necks are my favorite. So I'm like the champion of naked necks. Okay, so we want to thank you both for coming on the show, spending this hour with us and chatting chickens. It's been so much fun getting to know you. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I hope we can do this again. This has been great. Yeah, I hope so, too. I love talking chicken. This was a lot of fun. I think we're very much like-minded in how we feel about teaching people about chickens and being inclusive. and, And I love that. Yeah, it was a great round table. I love talking we, to you guys. We will most definitely have you back on the show. So thank you again. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. We just want to thank Mark and Twain one more time for coming to visit us and having a fantastic conversation. A big thanks to the crew at Neutrina and Cargill. We, we love those guys. Loved working with you. Thank you so much. Such a good time. Okay, so let's move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week's cracking the eggs is something that I came up with. Oh, yeah. I'm giving you the stink eye right now. <laughs> <laughs> strawberry streusel muffins. I had a hard time even Yummy. saying it. Stra- <laughs> strawberry streusel muffins. They are delicious, if I do say, do say so myself. <laughs> yeah. So, it's June. What is June known for? And we're still deep into strawberries, yeah. Strawberries. Yes. Yes. We love our strawberries. Well, originally, didn't you want me to make like... <laughs> Like a <laughs> cram, like a cheesecake, like a cheesecake. That's muffin. gonna be later. We're gonna do that later. Let's not talk about our secrets here with our recipes. We just made a strawberry cheesecake. <laughs> so <laughs> these are strawberry streusel muffins. They are actually really, really good. We used fresh strawberries, and that's what we recommend. But if all you can get is frozen, that will work. Yeah, no worries. Exactly. And if you go support your local farmer's market this time of the year because this is when you can get those fresh strawberries from your local farms. Yeah. And they're not too expensive. You know, try the farmer's markets. They are so good and you're going to love it in this. So let's start with the ingredients. Let's just list them quickly. Two thirds of a cup of sugar, a quarter cup of butter softened, one egg, so you're not breaking the bank with your eggs, right. two and a third cups of flour or the gluten-free equivalent, one to one, We need one teaspoon of baking powder and a half a teaspoon of baking soda. We want a lot of rise in these muffins. A half a teaspoon of salt, a cup of buttermilk, a teaspoon of vanilla extract, a quarter teaspoon of almond extract, and the most important ingredient of all, one and a half cups of fresh strawberries chopped into very small pieces. Now, you can use frozen, but again, really dry them out because they tend to hold moisture and they're going to make your muffin soggy. Yep, yep. So, and for the streusel, quickly, we're going to go with a quarter cup of brown sugar, two tablespoons of all-purpose flour or gluten-free, two tablespoons of almond flour or almond meal, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, and two tablespoons chilled of your butter. And, you know, both places with the butter, I, of course, use dairy-free butter. Oh, yeah. And I, unfortunately, I think I've gotten myself into a place where I'm so used to just using dairy-free butter that I just write butter. But it's okay. Everybody knows that all of these recipes... Go either way. Uh, Right, exactly. So you can very easily switch the ingredients to gluten-free, dairy-free. The recipe works the same way. When I put the recipes on the website, I will update that just in case we have new listeners who don't know. So dairy-free butter works just as fine. Now let's start with preheating that oven to 350. You're going to make the streusel first. So you're going to take a small bowl. You're going to mix together the sugar, flour, and cinnamon and cut the butter in until it's crumbly. Basic streusel. Now don't do what I did. Don't leave it sitting on the counter. (laughs) (laughs) 
because then the butter gets really soft. The butter's chilled, so it just took longer for the butter to melt, yes. but then it melted. Yes, it did. And so my streusel was big pieces. So <laughs> once you do this, pop it in the fridge or even the freezer if it's yeah. really warm. You're going to take a medium bowl. You're going to combine your dry ingredients, your flour or gluten-free flour, your baking powder, baking soda, and salt. Set that aside. Get out the big bowl. In the big bowl, you're going to cream together the butter and sugar until it's fluffy. Now, I actually made these and then I made a variation of these. I just made these into a coffee cake. Oh, yeah. I used the exact ingredients and just made it into a coffee cake. So it does work that way. A lot of the muffin recipes, I like that because you can just put them in a different pan. Right. And make, it's the same thing. It's just shaped differently. However you want to do it. So large mixing bowl, cream the butter and the sugar until fluffy, add your egg and mix well. And what made me think of the coffee cake is I wanted to tell you that two thirds of a cup of sugar, you can bump up a little bit if you're doing the coffee cake. Well, heck yeah, we're going to bump it up here. I know you are. I've already bumped it up in my mind. Exactly. Yes. So once you have the egg mixed into the butter and sugar, you're going to add the flour mixture and the buttermilk, add them all at once. And again, for our dairy-free folk, I'll have the quick instructions for making your own buttermilk. Right. You're going to beat all that just until it's blended. Then you're going to add the extracts and the strawberries. You're going to fold those in. With everything that you're going to add as the last ingredient to anything, you're folding in. You're not going to be mixing it. It's just a fold in. And then you can use a very well sprayed muffin pan or you can put papers in it if you want. I like the different papers that you can get for the seasons with fun prints. It is kind of fun. And if you're going to do this for a chicken talk, chicken papers... Yeah. Papers with chickens on them. You can also use this for super big muffins, little muffins, mini muffins. That's what I was about to say. So I did them in my six muffin jumbo tin. And I used parchment paper to make my own really rustic looking muffin papers. Yeah. It looked fantastic. I am a huge fan of the jumbo muffin. So Uh back in the day, all you could get were like the small, like the medium sized muffins. Yeah, the little ones. Or the cupcakes. The standard. Yeah. And I was like, eh, no, 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 no. So I went out and bought two, and I find out that's all I use now, I have, yeah. or the minis. So I'm like, the middle ones are kind of like, I just throw them to the side. I love the jumbo muffins. Love I them. love the jumbo muffins too, and I love them for cupcakes. Although I will say, my usual cupcake pan that I do almost everything in is slightly bigger than standard muffins, Okay, and it's a tin that I got from Ikea. Oh, okay. And so they're not jumbo. But they're definitely bigger than the standard. I really like that one too. Wilton is the brand that has all the jumbo. Yeah. Yeah, they have all the jumbo. That's what all of mine are. Yeah, Wilton. So you're going to pop these into the oven for 25 to 30 minutes until they're browned and the tester comes out clean. If you do the coffee cake version, it might be more like 35 minutes. But it rises and browns pretty quickly. You just have to watch. With everything that you change size-wise, it's going to change your baking. Right. So just know, you know what you're looking at in the oven and make sure that it comes out clean. And then you invite your bestie over, you talk some chickens, you sit outside with a beverage and a big muffin, and you have fun. I'm hungry now. Let's go make some muffins. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So if try it. You might like it. Send us pictures. We want to see. It's strawberry time. We want to see these strawberry muffins. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. This week's retail therapy is something that I found when I was sitting on the computer one Sunday morning, just kind of looking through. We're always researching. Right. I'm usually researching the shopping side of it. -uh. (laughs) Nuh-uh. And I had to tell you instantly. I'm like, we need to talk about this. If I had known about these things when I got married, like my half of my registry registry would have, yeah. So this is, it's actually a UK company called Mason Cash. I did not know they existed until I found them. Well, they're kind of interesting in a lot of ways. I know our UK listeners are probably rolling their eyes because they know all about Mason Cash. Mason Cash is a pottery company, essentially. They originated in an area called Church Gressley, which it was near the center of the English ceramic industry in the 1800s. Wow. They made mixing bowls even back then in the 1800s, and they're known for these big, heavy, beautiful pottery bowls. They also make hen-on-nest dishes. (laughs) Yeah, and they're super cute, and they're affordable. Now, the way I found them was through King Arthur Baking. That's what, yes, me too. They're running some sort of like partnership with Mason Cash right now, and 
They have a chicken mixing bowl and a farm mixing bowl set. Yeah, so the oh. chicken the chicken mixing bowl has this bright blue glaze. It's absolutely beautiful. It's about thirty dollars on the King Arthur twenty nine dollars, and it's the whole scene of the chicken in the yard with the fence and the trees and everything else. It's just so whimsical. It makes you happy to bake. And the whole set, it's called In the Farmyard. This whole set of bowls, there's a big red one with horses. There's a slightly smaller white one with pigs. And then there's the blue chicken bowl. If you want to get the whole set from King Arthur, it's $120. I mean, that's not terrible if you want a gift for a holiday. That's what I'm saying. It would have been on my wedding registry. (laughs) Your husband's like, I have no idea what to buy you. You know, if you like to bake, Big, heavy mixing bowls are super nice. And here's the other thing I've realized about them. I use them as serving bowls also. Well, these are fantastic because they're an earthenware that is microwave, freezer, and dishwasher safe. Doesn't get any better. As a hobby potter, I can tell you that's going to be a combination of your clay and your glaze. Yeah. I mean, and they're beautiful. That's why I say that you can use them for baking, but then you can stick them on your table with Something like a salad, a potato salad or something and, you know, just to serve. Yeah. They're so beautiful that you're going to want to show them off. The thing I like about the lip of the bowl is the scalloping that goes all the way around. It's really pretty. They're so detailed and they're like etched and they're like 3D. So yeah, it's a relief pattern with the glaze over top. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. And the hens on nest, let me tell you, they're really cool. Okay. The hens on nest almost made me lose my mind. They're so cute. One of them is... I believe she's called hen and egg. Yes. And it's a hen with a Columbia pattern. Oh, my goodness. So cute. They're just beautiful. Oh, my goodness. You, you can't go you wrong. You get me one for Christmas and I'll get you one for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, they're not too badly priced. They were like $45 for one. And that's not badly priced. So this is a UK company. And you can get the mixing bowls here we saw. But can you get the hen's own nest here? I believe so. Okay. I, I hope so. Because that's what you're getting for Christmas. Yeah. Where did you find them? Where did I find them? I don't know. It's just searching around the internet and there they came up. King Arthur, the ad for the King Arthur one came up and then I went searching. So they also have a cream head on a nest, which is really cool. With- so she's all one color. She's yes. just a cream color glaze. That's mm-hmm. beautiful. Yeah. I mean, and that one's $38 on eBay. I mean. Oh, she's secondhand on eBay? Yeah. Okay. So they're very collectible, clearly. Yeah. And, you know, we always need a ton more hens on nests. Come on. So I took a look around. You can get a lot of the Mason Cash mixing bowls on Amazon. Not the chicken pattern, but a lot of other beautiful patterns. Yeah. You can also get these beautiful stoneware batter bowls. Right. Which I absolutely love. Alas, we could not find the hens on the nest on Amazon. So I think you're going to have to do some Google searching and go to eBay or Etsy. And get them secondhand if you're here in the U.S. Exactly. Yeah. Boo hiss. We want them over here. Oh, they're so, they're wonderful. I love them. them over here. Okay, so check this out. You're going to love it. We love it. Mm -hmm. It's great. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Yes, we should. Next week, we're spotlighting a breed that you've seen a lot lately. Yes, the Houdan. The Houdan. GG! For our main topic, we're talking about an issue that comes up sometimes when you have new layers. A lot of you have hens just beginning to lay, and that is prolapse. It happened to one of mine. Cracking the eggs. We're going French. Yes, we are. We're doing Madelines. Mmm, they're going to be good. And for retail therapy, we are spotlighting a really neat little company, the Mother Hen Tea Company. So they can drink the tea with the cookies. Perfect. It'll be great. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.